Hi everyone, my name's Robin Beck. And I'm Catherine Yates. And we recently joined the School of Environment and Life Sciences here at the University of Salford. We're both members of the Ecosystems and Environment Research Centre. I'm interested in the evolution of animals and how they've diversified in time and space. And I'm a marine spatial planner interested in the conservation of biodiversity and the incorporation of stakeholders into governance. And we're going to take a look at some of the work that researchers in the centre have been doing. So let's take a look. Super. Hi Mike, thank you for joining us today to talk about your research. Could we start with you introducing yourself please? Yes, I'm Dr Mike Wood. I'm a reader in applied ecology here at the University of Salford. And what is it that you're researching Mike? So my research is about the impact of radiation on wildlife. And currently I'm undertaking a five year program of NERC funded research in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So here you have a, a map of part of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the Ukrainian side of the zone. This is the Belarusian part up to the north. The whole zone is about the size of Northumbria, so it's a large area. And 30 years ago, it was contaminated by release of radiation from a nuclear reactor. And in each of these three sites, I'm undertaking research on the impacts of radiation on wildlife. And what attracted you to this kind of research? Well, I've always been fascinated in all types of science. I love chemistry, physics and biology. And the great thing about this radioecology work that I do is it requires you to have an understanding of all three discipline areas and bring them together to be able to deliver this type of science. And what research techniques are you using to do that? So within each of these three study areas that we've got, we're using motion activated cameras that are triggered as an animal moves in front of the camera. And that allows us to capture images of the, certainly the larger mammals that are present within these areas. We're also using acoustic recorders which capture the full soundscape. So we can take the sounds of birds, of insects, of amphibians like frogs, as well as the sounds of large mammals. And these two devices together give us a much more comprehensive overview of biodiversity within each of these study areas. And how are you sharing this? How are you communicating these discoveries? We realised quite early on that this was something that was a good story to tell for the public, but we needed to be able to get the public to understand more about Chernobyl and the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. So what we did was we took out a 360 degree video camera and we captured footage at different sites within the zone and then worked with the virtual reality development team here at the University of Salford to create Virtual Chernobyl, a virtual tour of the exclusion zone where people can decide where they want to go and go off and explore areas for themselves. Sounds great. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your research with us today. Thank you. So Stefano, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your role in EERC? Yes, Robin. Um, I am a professor of conservation genetics, which essentially means that we employ uh, the knowledge of population genetics and we apply it to the conservation of biodiversity. So you've done a lot of research on aquatic organisms. Why are you particularly interested in those? Um, but to some extent, I think it's innate. You are born with certain predispositions. Someone loved to be thrown into space. I personally always had this fascination about what lives underwater. And since I was a very tiny little kid, every time I was spending some time in front of a bay or a lake or a river, I had this incredible drive to just imagine what the animals we're doing there, how many animals, what type of animals live there and how can I get closer to them. And so you learn to snorkel, you learn to fish, to get this closer contact with this, this, this world, this foreign world for us. So where has your research taken you around the world? So I've done a bit of research almost in every ocean around the world. Uh, I am originally from Italy, so uh, the Mediterranean has been the, the mainstay of my studies. I still have a lot of projects in collaboration with Mediterranean-based researchers, but I had the chance to work on projects uh, such one where I was sampling sex-changing fish in South Africa and in Natal, in the Caribbean to sample sharks. So actually, yeah, I can, I can consider myself quite happy. So, what do you think your most significant findings have been? Without, without any doubt, I would say probably my work on seafood mislabeling uh, is the one that, that, that had the greatest impact also outside academia because 
Um, it's something that every person in the world can relate to. Uh, beginning to understand that uh, the fillet of fish you've just purchased might not be that species of fish. So thanks very much for talking to us about your research today, Stefano. Thank you very much, Robin. Hello, Mark. Really good to be here today with you in Peel Park and find out about your research. Could we start off by you telling us a bit about yourself? Hello, Catherine. My name's Mark Danson. I'm Professor of Environmental Remote Sensing here at the University of Salford. Today, I'm joined by Fadel Sasse, who's a PhD researcher from Libya. Fabulous. And what is it that you're researching? Well, our research aims to measure the structure and species composition in forest and woodland canopies. And we want to try to use these measurements to better understand how forest management and climate change affect the uh, ecology of forest ecosystems. And why is that research so important? Well, as you can see in the park here today, uh, it's very difficult actually to make even simple measurements in forest environments. So imagine, for example, measuring the height of all these trees. And so what we've done is we've uh, designed and built a new instrument, the Salford Advanced Laser Canopy Analyzer, or SALSA for short. And this is an instrument that uses lasers to measure the three-dimensional structure of forest canopies very accurately. That sounds really interesting. What have been your key findings so far? Well, we found that SALSA uh, produces really very accurate uh, measurements of forest canopies. Actually, we've also found that the instrument has the capability to measure things like uh, leaf water content, leaf biomass, and over time, the growth rate of forests. And what are you hoping for your research in the future? So we're hoping that instruments like SALSA will produce very, very accurate measurements of forest canopies that allow us to better understand the relationships between climate change, forest management and forest ecology. Thank you, Mark. It's been really interesting. Thanks for sharing your research with us today. Thank you, Catherine. Nice to see you, Priya. Could you tell us a bit about your role here at Salford? Well, Robin, I'm a lecturer in safety, health and environment, uh, but I work in the area of environmental toxicology. So can you tell us a bit more in detail about what kind of research you do? Of course, uh, I think the best way to describe is, is to say like you and me live in a pool of contaminants. So I try to figure out what are the effect of certain chemicals, specifically for my research, it's focused towards heavy metals like arsenic on human health. So I know you do quite a lot of your research in Southeast Asia. Can you give us more detail about that? I'm from India and in India, unfortunately, millions of people are exposed to arsenic which is present in naturally in their drinking water. It is also termed as the world worst mass poisoning. So I started looking into the effect of arsenic exposure, not from drinking water, but from rice intake. So what kind of work are you doing in the lab at the moment? Currently we are doing an interesting project. So we are looking into the effect of different type of cooking techniques on the arsenic content in rice, as well as if it affects the other essential nutrients and the micronutrients because if you remember that rice is the most important source of nutrients especially with populations from low socio-economic background like in Bengal and Bangladesh. So what might be some of the benefits for human health? One of the significant uh, benefit or effect from this research could be to help the policymakers and the legislators to find out a limit of contaminants especially arsenic in rice. So thanks very much Priya for talking about it. It's fantastic work making rice safe for people around the world. Thank you very much Robin for coming today, taking your time and talking to me. It was a pleasure talking about my research with you. Hi Mike, nice to meet you. Could you tell me a bit about yourself? Okay, my name is Mike Rogan. I'm currently Professor of Zoology in the School of Environment and Life Sciences and I'm a parasitologist. And what is it that you research, Mike? I look at a group of parasites which are very small tapeworms in dogs, and the genus is called the Echinococcus. And they don't cause any problems as such in the dogs, but accidentally humans can become infected with the larval stage, which causes really big problems in the human, very big cysts to occur in the liver and the lungs, and it causes major problems in, in terms of health care. And how did you get into this kind of research? Um, my interest in parasites started from when I was an undergraduate, and I studied zoology. 
But the animals I liked to study were actually parasitic worms, which I felt were really highly adapted to the environment that they live in. They have various specialisms which adapt them to parasitism, and I found that fascinating. I then had the chance to go and work in the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where I can actually then go to places where parasites were a big problem. So some of the places I've visited since then and now I include China, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan and, and recently in the Falkland Islands as well, all looking at the same parasitic infection in those locations. And um, what research techniques do you do? What we're trying to do is go into really quite difficult areas, very difficult rural areas, and to develop techniques and diagnostic tests which can help us establish how much of an infection is in a particular community. So we've developed tests where we can look at which dogs are infected with the parasite. We've developed tests which look at which humans might be exposed to the parasite and how the disease is progressing within those humans and then hopefully trying to alleviate that system in different parts of the world. That's fascinating. What are you hoping to do in the future? By identifying different parts of different countries which are a problem, what we hope to do is get governments to recognise what the problem is and to start developing control strategies to try and reduce the level of infection to humans. Sounds like really important work. Thanks for sharing, Mike. Nice for you to come and see me. Thank you. So, Louisa, thanks for inviting me to Chester Zoo to talk about your research. Can you introduce yourself, please? So, my name is Luisa Passos. I'm a PhD student from the University of Salford, and I'm working with Professor Robbie Young. What exactly is your research project about? So, my research right now is actually focusing on comparing the animals in captivity with the animals in the wild. Different aspects like coloration, body condition, the callings, hormone levels, and see if the captivity is affecting the animals, how much is affecting, if these animals could be released back in the wild in the reintroduction program, and see if they would survive. So you're stood next to some really beautiful looking frogs. Can you tell me a bit about the species? Yeah, those are the golden mantella frogs. They are endangered species from Madagascar. They are one of my target species. So they're quite endangered in the wild and they are part of a conservation breeding program. So different zoos and different captivities are breeding those animals to release them back in the wild to try to boost the population numbers. But you don't just work on frogs. What are some of the other species you work on? So another target species that I have on my PhD is the Jamaica no or the blue no. It's a blue greenish lizard from Jamaica, but I'm working with the population that it's in Bermuda. And it's a similar idea comparing the wild individuals, the captive ones. The difference with these ones that I collect them in the wild and I put them in captivity to see how in one year how much they would change the behavioral plasticity, how they would adapt to this new environment. So what have been some of the biggest findings you've made so far? So I have found out that the captivity does affect. When you check coloration, if you see those frogs over here, they look quite orange, quite bright. But when you go to field, you see the animals are quite different. So understand there is a whole interaction of different factors like UV light and the diet and humidity and everything together that gives the right color. Because a lot of people think the frogs don't need UV light, they don't really see them like standing in the sun. And we have found out that they need a, a certain amount of UV to keep the colorations going. So it's like the cool thing is about discovering the, all these different small aspects interacting together to get like, the right condition for the frogs to survive. Thanks Louisa for talking with us today. Um, it's great research and it's brilliant to see you helping to save endangered species. I'm not sure about you, Robin, but I found that really interesting today. Yeah, it was fantastic learning about the research that ERC is doing all around the world. So the work from Mike Wood on radio ecology, the work of Mark Danson on remote sensing, and of course Mike Rogan's work on the parasite Echinococcus. Well, I saw Louisa Passos' research into the golden mantella frog she's doing at Chester Zoo. There's Stefano Mariani's research into shark conservation, and I heard about Prim Mandal's work on rice production in India. And there's so much more to find out about. You can follow our work on our website or via our Twitter account. So thanks very much for joining us today and hearing about the research that we're doing here at EERC.